Dirty Moderates, uh, you all have heard me say time and time again, probably almost every show at some point, that America is nothing if not an idea. Uh, America is also um, a, a, as Walt Whitman might say, a country, I'm paraphrasing, that contains multitudes. It is a uh, messy country, noble, wonderful, um, dysfunctional, but uh, an experiment. And there's a lot of truth to those words. Um, and exploring those ideas, you know, is fundamental to what we do here at this podcast um, because we are at an inflection point, not to use the overturned uh, phrase, at, in our democracy. Uh, our guardrails are being tested at every turn. For a variety of reasons, we're facing uh, threats of illiberalism and authoritarianism, but we also have a, a, a cult of ignorance in this country um, that is not unique uh, to our era. It's also not owned exclusively by the right. And it's all over the place. So um, I always like to bring on uh, celebrated thinkers, scholars, authors, and the like to try to, as I, as I like to say, generate not heat, but light. So it's with uh, a great honor that I welcome Joseph J. Ellis to the podcast. Uh, before I, I, I bring him in, I, I want to let everybody know, if you don't know, you've been living under a rock. He's the author of 12 books. Um, he's the best-selling author. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner for his book, Founding Brothers. Many of you may remember that book. Uh, you may remember American Sphinx on Thomas Jefferson. He won a National Book Award for that. Uh, we're going to talk mainly about his latest book, The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents. Um, but we are going to talk about ideas, something that um, I think he is uh, more than qualified for, but I think will be a, a really um, unique uh, an invaluable uh, source for our discussion. Uh, Joe, welcome to the show. Adam, pleasure to be with you this day. I'm Thank coming you. to you from middle of Vermont on a big yeah. mountain. We just got 27 inches of snow yesterday. So the two ski slopes near Okemo and Killington are both packed today and everybody's thrilled. But I'm happy to be inside talking to you. Oh, I am. I'm so glad you're here. Before I, uh, before we we get into it, I I I was thinking of some ideas to talk to you about. Of course, they're all going to relate to the cause, but the discussing mm. the cause is discussing America. And I thought of, of a term because the book, for those that don't know, is a, mainly about um, the ideas in many ways behind the Revolutionary War, and 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 we have fabulous history here about the end of the French and Indian War, and, and then the way that colonists really thought they were more British, let's say at the time than American, there's a lot to unpack, but there's a term you use in the book, I think is amazing because it's oxymoronic and beautiful. You refer to the colonists as prudent revolutionaries. Oh, yes. I've never thought of a revolutionary as prudent. Um, by definition, American, a revolutionary can't be prudent. Can't that's be prudent. Right. That's right. right. That's why I think it's, uh, it's an oxymoron of, of greatness. Can mm -hmm. we start with that? Um, sure, sure. Okay. Um, um, the collection of people that came together and we call the founders. Right. Um, they created two foundings, really. One was 76 when we declare independence from Great Britain, and the other was 87 when we declare nationhood under the Constitution. The revolutionary side of it, which is what the most recent Ellis book is about, is essentially saying that the American Revolution wasn't really a revolution. Um, it was a war for colonial independence, the first of its kind in world history, as a matter of fact, with a revolutionary agenda. Hmm. But in order for the war to succeed against Britain, there had to be unity among the 13 colonies and eventually states. And in order to achieve that unity, any kind of radical agenda needed to be deferred. Because once you start raising the question of say slavery, ending mm -hmm. slavery, mm -hmm. rights for women, ending the property qualification to vote, all of which were discussed by people at the time in 75 and 76, We've got to postpone that. We are, we're not 
like the French intellectuals who promote the French Revolution, sort of dilettantes, we're all experienced lawmakers from our mm. respective colonies. Most of them have law degrees. Adams is the most outspoken on this issue, John Adams, who is my sort of favorite founder because he tells you what he's really thinking all the time. Yeah. And that um, he's one of the earliest of the founders to commit to the idea of independence. That if you see the play 1776, they've got sure. it right there. He's, you know, he's pushing everybody in a direction that many of them don't want to go. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, he's also the out, most outspoken voice that independence per se needs to be achieved first before we can address any of these other issues. Um, slavery, the top one on the list. So that they're prudent revolutionaries. And if you think about it, if you think that justice delayed is justice denied, you know, mm. and certainly if you're an African-American or a woman, you could even make that case pretty strongly. But look what happens in France. Look what happens in Russia. In France, in the French Revolution, attempt to implement the full uh, implications of their enlightened values. And the result is the guillotine and Napoleon. In Russia, when they attempt to implement it also completely, uh, the result is the firing squad wall, um, the, Siberia, and Stalin. Lenin and then Stalin. Um, so that in this case, deferring the full radical agenda, in my judgment, was a shrewd mm. and effective tactic. Um, and that you you can't go back and look from our modern and present perspective and say, oh, gosh, they should have insisted upon ending slavery. Or they should have looked forward to allowing more women into the into public into the public life. All that. That's from our modern perspective. If you right. inhabit their mentality at that, in that world, um, you understand that that is really unfair to do. It's much like going yeah. to Samoa and saying, how come they don't practice the child rearing tactics of, of, of Dr. Spock? Or you know, <laughs> going to Africa and being disappointed because the Africans right. have never heard right. of, never heard of Jesus and um, right um, right uh, so well, it's a it's a presentist they call that a presentist view of history right that's Putting, correct and grafting the, grafting an American uh, excuse me a, a present day perspective on events from two hundred fifty years ago that or is for right. any period really yeah for any period but um, yeah. uh, but it's it seems to me that presentism is the original sin of historians. Yeah. If slavery is the original sin of American history, and I think yeah. it is. Yeah. Originalism is the original sin. I mean, excuse me. Presentism is the original sin of historians because it's not just white supremacy. It's our supremacy over them. Mm -hmm. People who are dead and gone and can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So that I write with an attempt to dip you into that world, to bring it, have it come alive to you as a 21st century person so that you can inhabit their mentality and see what they were thinking and feeling at that time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth on that point, giving people, um, a little bit of background because you have, you know, a distinguished academic pedigree, but few people, if any, write with write for a popular audience with, um, your accessibility, your sparkle, you know, your muscular prose, you know, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of academics, Certainly, the ones I was educated by, as brilliant as they were, they they weren't what I would call great prose stylists uh, or particularly captivating writers. Historiography. Let's mm. talk about it. You know the schools of it. What is historiography? What have been the schools of thought about American history and specifically early American history mm. that have evolved over time? I think that's a good conversation. It is. It's a huge one to our listeners. Historiography is the history of history. Yeah. And when you go to graduate school in history, one of the first courses you take, let's say you're an Americanist, an Americanist, is the course on all the historians that have written about, let's say, the revolution or uh, earlier America who come before you. And so you say, well, why do I have to read that? Because they have come before you and they right. pose the question. They have put down the, gra the guardrails and the signs. And you should be aware of who they are and what they had to say. And you should right. 
in some cases, make new contributions that goes beyond them, argue with them. But it's like your parents. Yeah. You got to know what your parents were. And um, uh, I think that that um, my own evolution as a historian, and I didn't major in history in college. Okay. God knows how I ever got into Yale, but, but I majored in philosophy. Right. And um, I never saw myself as an academic who was going to be writing to other academics. Right. Um, uh, I came to see myself as a writer who would be addressing the kind of students that I taught first at West Point, then at Mount Holyoke, later shortly at Williams and Amherst, namely really smart young people with a genuine interest in history who know nothing. Okay, and um, and yeah. that's my audience, uh, and that's who I'm writing to. Now I've got all kinds of end notes in books that you know scholars can look up and sure. do that kind of thing. But that um, back to your point, the historiography of the American Revolution. Yeah. Um, in the 19th century, early histories, the distinguishing event the distinguishing interpretive line was to see the founding generation as demigods as okay. all the, as most mythical creatures right um and the achievement of the revolution as a kind of miracle read, rendered by these um larger than life creatures that began to die off in the beginning of the 20th century with uh, bernard with several historians uh, charles beard yeah. questioning this then um and it moved in in the 20th century to a discussion of the ideology of the american revolution right and the way in which that ideology was generated by an elite these are the people like jefferson and adams and franklin and madison and hamilton mm -hmm. um washington doesn't make the list he's not really a great thinker he's just a doer but um but he's mm -hmm. the, he's the foundingest father of them all um oh um, sure yeah he is um if you took a you know franklin's the wisest jefferson's the best writer most intellectually yeah. sophisticated adams is the best read and the most candid yeah. madison is the most shrewd political operative if god were in the details madison would be there to greet him upon arrival um, <laughs> right. and hamilton is probably the guy that would have got the highest score on the lsats right um i love that but they all agree washington is the greatest um anyway the whole notion of mythological heroes is going is, is being is being challenged by the early 20th century and i step into that later in the century simply saying yes that this is the most impressive generation of political leaders we've ever had but they were all flawed figures they were all human beings sure. like you and me um and in yeah. fact one of the secrets of their success is their diversity when you say yeah. what the founders thought, hey, Jefferson didn't agree with Adams about a lot of stuff. And they engaged in a yeah. correspondence in their twilight years where it was fairly clear. They both were yeah. leading figures in this thing called the revolution, and they didn't agree about what they were doing or had done. Um, right. There tended to be a split in the profession between intellectual historians and social historians. The okay. intellectual historians, these are guys like Balin and uh, Wood. Right. Um, so people, Ooh. people know Bernard Balin is a titan of history, early American history, especially at Harvard. Uh, yep. Gordon S. Wood uh, was his student. Is that right? Was Gordon his student? Yes, he was. Yes, yeah. and Gordon uh, taught at my alma mater, Brown, was chairman of the history department there for many many years, and is also uh, like you, Joe, widely published to a popular audience yep. on uh, the on American early. Yeah, we together. Yeah. And I, I want to insert one. I want to insert one thing. And I heard you say it's so I want to I want to repeat something that you said for the audience too. somebody said you are a historian, you know, of, of president early presidents and, and, and you corrected them rightly and said, no, 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 no. I'm not a presidential historian. I'm a historian. I'm an Americanist and a historian of the founding, the whole founding of the country. And I, I, and I, I think that's I important. Have, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. In fact, because people who have read you know that. 
There's yeah. no graduate school in the United States that has a field called presidential history. No. All the people that are presidential historians are journalists who do history. Okay. And right. they sometimes yeah. do it quite well. Uh, yeah. I have written biographies of three presidents, the first three, Washington, Adams, yeah. and Jefferson. Yeah. But no, no. Um, and my, my area is the so-called founding, which is the late right. 18th and early 19th century. Let me just finish the point out, sure, sure, sure. namely yeah. that the, the, the people like Gordon Wood and, 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 and partly me uh, say we were interested in the ideas of the revolution, yeah. the ideology of the revolution, and that means we're interested in an elite. Yeah. That is the people I just got mentioned, the people who are writing the pamphlets um, and um, the people who are shaping opinion. There's another school of thought of social history, which is wants to look at people on the ground. They are interested in the importance of the ordinary. Um, and in the current book, The Cause, I'm saying we need both of those stories. Right. That one is the words and the other is the music of the American Revolution. And you can't mm. have one without the other. Mm. Um, and that the values that are being developed that lead towards independence and a belief in the values of equality that Jefferson most, you know, the, the most important 55 words in American history are in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. um, but that on the ground, ordinary people um, are being forced into the revolution and their, their role is crucial. One of the reasons the Brits could never win the war hmm. And they had to win it. All we had to do is not lose it. Was that they couldn't control the countryside. They could win every battle. They could right. occupy Boston. They did. They could occupy New York. They could occupy right. Philadelphia. And they nearly won key battles. The Long Island and other they places. Won, they right. won that. They won all the key battles. Key battles. Boston yeah. is the, the greatest general that lost more battles than anybody else. Uh, right. But he won the war. Um the reason is that they couldn't, they were an army to, of conquest, but they were not big enough to be an army of occupation. Right. And as soon as they left, at the local level, control went into the hands of the, of the patriots. And here is, I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain something to you and your, your listeners. Sure. They passed in 19, in, in, 19, in 1775. Yeah. In the Continental Congress, they created something called the Continental Association. At right. that stage, they hadn't decided to on independence, but they were opposing British policy. And the Continental Association was supposed to enforce non-importation agreements to sort of try to, to not buy British goods and thereby get them to come to their senses. Right. That set up over 5,000 committees. Amazing. In, every town, village, hamlet in the United States. And here's what would happen. You're living in a house and your neighbor comes by. It might be a woman, might be a man. Let's say it's a woman. It says, hi, how are you, Adam? Uh, I'm here to ask you to sign this document that says that you will not buy British uh, goods and we'd like you to sign it right now. And you say, well, thank you very much, Edith, if that's your name. <laughs> but I need some time to think about this, okay? And she says, no problem. I'll come back in a couple of days to see you. Okay. A couple of days later, she comes by to see you. And you still say, well, I don't know about this. And she says, well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really sorry to hear that, Adam, because I'm going to have to list you. And then your na name will be in the newspaper as a trader. You will not be able to buy anything at the grocery store. You cannot go to church. You're not going to dances. And... Um, you ought seriously to change your opinion. I'll give you another week. Mm -hmm. Gives him another week. Comes by. He still can't decide. She says, I really think you should leave your house because in three days we are going to come and burn it down. And if you're hmm. in it, we'll kill you. That's what's happening on the ground. Okay? Yeah. So right. that while 40% of the uh, population is patriot, pro-independence, 20% is loyalist. 40% wants it the hall go to go away. 
They're disinterested. But that's where the 40% gets converted to commitment. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I do. And, so, and there, and, and it's being done not at the stratospheric level of ideology, but at the local level. And, and that is crucial, crucial for the success of the revolution. So uh, you need the top and you need the bottom. Yep. And you need, like you said, the, the words and the music, right? The words now, and the music. Yeah. I, 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 I want to interject here because I thought what the book, uh, The Cause, did so well. And again, I spend so much of my <laughs> my day thinking about America. So I'm very inside of it, as are you. But for our listeners, the thing that astounded me about you unpacking this history um, was when you talk about the Continental Association, you have a country uh, – you know, on the brink of revolution and independence, you know, rallying itself, mm. however disparate, not unified, right? 13 colonies all working separately, but yet they kind of come together for this with some semblance of unity. Yes. Where, but, but after the war, right? Yeah. You know, and obviously the end result of that, which carries us through today, is the Federalist versus Anti Federalist debate, the divide right. in politics. But in those years following the war, the Articles of Confederation, even during the war, one state not wanting to finance the, the military, uh, the materiel and boots of another state. You know, there is no unity that, that right. comes there. There's 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 the sense of tremendous fear of unity because that would smack even 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 a smidgen of British tyranny, That's you know, right. expansive state power. These are the debates we're still having in America. So it's fascinating that they could come together. I love this whole history of Continental Association, right? To to again, as you put it, you know, for independence, but also more for what you call imperial reform mm -hmm. than outright um, separation. Yeah, but you're getting at something really important, uh, Adam, and I, I'll try to help develop it and deepen Please. it a bit. Namely, let me put it to you somewhat overly cleverly. The first sentence in the most famous speech in American history is historically incorrect. Lincoln at Gettysburg said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. No, they didn't. Mm -mm. They brought forth what in the end of the war was called the Articles of Confederation. Right. There was a unit. The, the 13 colonies came together to win the war. And even that, many of the states refused to pay the taxes needed, refused to provide the troops for the Continental Army. They were interested in taking care of their own communities so that the militia got support, but not the Continental Army. The Continental Army was kept on life support throughout the war, never got above twelve to 15,000. It could have been at 90,000. Washington only asked for 60,000. If he had got 60,000, he would have won the war in two years. Mm. He never got it. He never got it. And so, so even so even the, what let's call it somewhat semblance of unity during the war was really not unity. I mean, there's still that wasn't it was unity, but not for a commitment to some national organization like the right. Continental Army. Right. Um, there was no national ethos. People didn't identify as Americans. They identified as South Carolinians or Virginians yeah. or Ma or New Yorkers. In some Even, sense, they still do. In some sense, they still do. Absolutely. Um, although the Internet, radio, roads and all, it's, yes. it's, it's much different now. Yeah. But yeah. That, that the and that the subtitle of the book and its discontents mm -hmm is a reference to something that touches on this. Namely, at the end of the war, the, the radical agenda, the leading item in the radical agenda is let's end slavery. Or let's put, more correctly, put slavery on the road to extinction. That's when there was still this enthusiasm for the values of the cause. But at that time, there was no national government that could ever enforce it. it. The only way it could be enforced was in a state by state basis. And every state south of the Potomac was never going to enforce it. It was no. going to happen 
piecemeal in the North. The first state to end slavery happens during the war. It is a state I am in now. Vermont, yeah, 1777. Vermont, yeah. 1777. It wasn't even a state at the time. Yeah. But uh, second, and there uh, was a very, very certainly it, it it evolved through the 19th century. But and you write about this in the book. But this is great history. I think gets lost in our presentist debates. Right. There was a healthy and hearty abolitionist movement in from the 1770s, 1780s on. You know, the first I mean, abolitionist Vermont, movement you know, in the world. The first abolitionist yeah. movement in the world is set up in Philadelphia right. in 76 by the Quakers. And uh, yeah, uh, and the agenda of uh, emancipation is yeah. on the record um, for the first time in any country in the world to include Great Britain. I mean, some of my friends think Britain ended slavery in early. They didn't. Britain yeah. doesn't end slavery for 50 years. Britain yeah. is the leading slave trader in the world at that time. Right. Um, right. So uh, so it seems that. The, the tragedy is that it is a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting. Is it a Greek tragedy or a Shakespearean tragedy? <laughs> what I mean by that yeah. is it something that was inevitable and no amount of leadership could have changed it? Or is it something that could have gone the other way? Um, that is an interesting argument that we, that Americans, should always, and I'll tell you, if anybody claims they've got an absolutely certain answer to that question, I'd like them to ascend into heaven because th th no human being can do it. Um, no, I would say this. In my in my first life, I was a man of the theater as a Broadway producer. And my listeners know, I don't know if you knew that, so I, I know a lot about theater. I always say about Greek theater, Greek and Shakespeare, which I both love, of course. And mm. I don't think you can have hubris without tragedy. Uh, so I say it's a bit of a hybrid to you. I, I can't answer it. I, I, you know, I don't think nothing's definitive, but I think there's a great line in F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. Show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, um, Mike, the point I was trying to just grind into here yeah. was that at the end of the war in 1783, when this treaty is signed. Yeah. Ending the war. And it's the, you know, it's an enormous victory. I mean, Huge. they get yeah. complete independence and control of all the land from the border of Canada to Florida and from the yeah. Atlantic. It's like, to the it's like what, a third of a continent or something? A third right? of a continent. That's right. Yeah. When right. the when the uh, British and the French diplomats, well, first of all, when they when they wanted to paint, have a portrait of the people negotiating the treaty, what we call the Treaty of Paris, the British delegation refused to show up. So in the painting, they're blank. Because they don't want to be, a, this is probably the greatest diplomatic loss in British history at, up until that point of time. They don't want to be associated with that. But there's a meeting that they then have with the French. And the French say, ah, oh, the Americans now are going to be a great imperial power. Look at the, the land they have here. This, as you say, a third of a continent, uh, bigger than France, England, and Germany put together. Okay. And the British say, yes, and every one of them will speak English. Um, uh, just as a way of putting the French down, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I, I want to actually, um, cause the book does this and this is good. I let's do some American, early American history. Let's do some events. Cause I think it's very instructive and it, it, it absolutely is, um, inextricably linked to, to the ideas we're talking about. Okay. So let's go backwards. So we've got what we were, what we learned, I learned is the French and Indian war also knows the seven years war. Right. That, that, uh, concludes in 1763. Is that right? Yes. It's, okay. It's confusing because the treaty ended, it's called the peace of Paris. Not the, the treaty of Paris. It's called the treaty. But it's, right. Yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. Right. So you, you've got the but you've got the end of this and you've got the British now in charge of, this landmass as huge we're land mass. it's the greatest victory ever you know imaginable they you know up until then great britain had conquered ireland and scotland and they had done the same domination of islands in the in the caribbean okay. chiefly jamaica and barbados but this is now for the first time truly yeah. a british empire okay yeah. Yeah. a british empire and um and and that I don't want to push this, but that what eventually is going to make the British 
make the biggest blunder in the history of British statecraft is yeah. that we have to defend the British. We have to hold on to this empire. And there's an initial form of what might be called uh, the domino theory. If we let the Americans go, wow, we lose Jamaica. We might lose India. Now, where well, have you well, heard well, that before? Is that, is, that, is that where our post Cold War folks got the domino theory from? No, they didn't. Did they That's, get it? From well, that Eisenhower is the one who came up with it. Yeah, nobody in the 18th century called it the domino theory. I'm right. using the, but they, it's the same exact idea. Right. You're if one country power, falls to communism, then, then they're all going to be if, communism. If, right. if this falls, that will go, and that will go, right. and that will go. And the, in I most know. instances, it's an exaggeration. It's not really true. No. But it, it has a dimension of truth to it sufficient to make the British convinced that if they don't insist on controlling the colonies that they've acquired, um, so th th they will witness a dis dissolution of the entire British Empire. Um, right. That is, uh, and again, for the first time, I think American readers and thinkers can somewhat empathize with the British on this because... Think of this. The newly arrived world power, Great Britain, steps onto the national stage for the first time as an imperial power, mm -hmm. convinced of its military supremacy and its economic supremacy as well. Okay. And it steps, it steps into a quagmire. It steps into an unnecessary and unwinnable war which is what's going to happen to them. Okay. Doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, I'm a vet. I mean, uh, Vietnam is part of my childhood in terms yeah. of memories. And, um, sure. uh, and you could even add Iraq to that. Um, but um, that it's the kind of mistake that new empires always make. Yep. And, um, and the Brits made it. Um, so to carry you back, you okay. were, you were, that at the end of here's what happens yeah. at the end of the seven years war great britain says well now we've got all this this new land how are we going to govern it because up till now uh, uh, edmund burke coined the phrase benign neglect mm -hmm. namely let's leave them alone let them do their own kind of thing but we can't do that now now we're really in charge now we've mm. got to establish a kind of level of control over that um, and that's when they start to pass legislation like the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Act. And these are all things to levy taxes or, or uh, sort of secret taxes on them. And that's what starts the problem rolling, because the colonists say we are British citizens and British citizens cannot be taxed without their consent. Right. So Parliament says, oh, we represent you over here in Parliament. No, you don't. The people that represent us are our legislatures in Virginia and Massachusetts and each of these kinds of things. So they've kind of got British law on their own side here. We're, you're denying us our rights as Englishmen. This is hardly a radical agenda at all. Um, and they, the opposition begins to form most visibly against the Stamp Act. But then it continues, and that it the the the, the real break point comes when they pass something called the uh, Intolerable Acts, which imposes on Massachusetts all kinds of constraints, mm -hmm. and in fact imposes military law. That's when they cross the Rubicon, mm -hmm. um, and when and I think Sam Adams actually threw the tea into the into the Boston Harbor, knowing that would generate that reaction from George III and the British. And the British fell for it and demonstrated. I mean, what what other what you could have said is, look, what the colonists were saying is, you attempt to and you're going to enslave us. Once we allow Parliament to tax, we've got no we can't we, we lost control you can do anything you want now they're not going to they're not going to go around killing them or anything what they're going to turn them into is colonists mm -hmm. second-rate british citizens mm -hmm. okay 
so that the American argument is a kind of what um, what do you kind of call, it's it's an exaggeration uh, of what's what's really threatening, but it's a plausible generation. And then Great Britain and George the Third do everything possible to make themselves into despicable creatures. They start to bombard the east coast of New England. Um, they occupy all of Boston. Um, they hire. They begin to hire Prussians uh, to support them. Uh, and the Prussians are famous for raping women and not taking prisoners. Mm. All these things are sort of happening in early '76, mm -hmm. and you got, and you got uh, Lexington and Concord, and then you get the Battle of Bunker Hill, which happens 15 months before the Declaration of Independence. Turns out mm. to be the bloodiest battle in the war. Yeah. Um, you would have thought they would learn from that. They lost over half of they 2000 guys went up, only 500 came back. Um, it was like, and when the bodies were sent back and the wounded went back to London and the, and the women and their wives and mothers met them, there was for the first time a kind of, oh my God, what have we stepped into here? But that the colonists uh, uh, resist declaring independence until the very last minute. Yeah, they, they really don't want to do this unless they absolutely have to, and the British force them. The British force them into doing it. Right. And um, and uh, and then you're right. The uh, the earliest battle in the war, the, once the war is really started, is in um, New York on Long Island. And uh, yeah. the Americans almost lose the war in the first battle. Right. If General Howe had conducted his tactical policy more aggressively. He could have got the whole Continental Army. They had him trapped. Yeah. Uh, and uh, remember, that's a, you know, water. They were surrounded by water, the British fleet. And, the, and they let them get a, they get a, they let them escape across the Hudson River at night. They, it happens. And everybody thinks the great movement across the water is, you know, the famous painting, of, you know, uh, Washington crossing to Delaware. Delaware, right? yeah. Somebody needs to make a painting of the more, that was important, but not as important as the earlier escape across the East River. When uh, he right. gets uh, 12,000 troops across at night, and the mm. weather perfect, fog, fog comes out, the gods are smiling on him and everything. If they had got them in the water, they would have destroyed the entire Continental Army. And I've tried to talk to historians over the years to say, but what would have happened? Yeah. What would have happened if they destroyed the Continental Army in the first months of war? The consensus, if there can be such a thing, is, well, we could have replaced the army, but we couldn't have replaced Washington. No. That's what they were saying. You know, so, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, no, that's important. Actually, on, the, on that, uh, uh, before we continue with the history, will you kind of talk a little bit about Valley Forge while we're at it? and, and like um, de Both discuss it and demystify it, which is, I think, by the way, what you do so well in your book. Books, not just this book. You explain yeah. how you, you talk about real people at yeah. a real time, you know, not haloing them or, you know, just uh, consigning them to some weird hell. You just, you reckon with them and they're real yeah. people with real, with a real war yeah. and, you know, you know, and that's I, important. One know? of the things I thought of doing, I didn't do it. I'll do it for you. Though, we ought to have a, something called unpainted pictures. Okay. That unlike other wars post camera, we have no, no pictures. All the pictures are, are um, portraits. Yeah. And, yeah. Let's take the army marching into Valley Forge. Okay. 15,000 people. Okay. 12,000 soldiers trailed by wives, prostitutes, workers. And if you look at the march in, it's a long, it's over a mile long, and it, all the snow is bloodied mm. because they're walking in bare feet. Mm -hmm. And they're going to this place called Valley Forge for the winter. And the desertion rate is 30% during that winter. Mm -hmm. Of the 12,000, 1,500 die. 
first casualty is a black guy, African American. He's found two days in, face down in his tent, killed from exposure and uh, malnutrition. Mm. This really was the time to try men's souls. And the leaders, the elite, the officers are made to think they are the last guard here. Every, and and that if we can survive this and come out the other side, but that, that, um, and by the way, they're not getting paid. No. Uh, they're not being given the, the ammunition and the support they need. And it really was a time of trial. Now, what you were referring to, the mystique, you know, there's paintings of Washington kneeling yeah. in the snow, you know, yeah. praying to God. Yeah. All fabrications never yeah. happened. Um, uh, Washington, even when he went to church, never knelt. <laughs> um, and um, Washington also said anyone who says they know precisely what underwent or excuse me precisely what this nation underwent during the Revolutionary War would be telling the story of fiction because they don't that's right if, yeah. if we ever told the truth nobody right. would believe it they would think right. it was fiction that's right, right. That's right. he right. says that at the end and um, uh, and um, and that he's, he's really right so that on the one hand, it really is a super patriotic moment that really does deserve to be noticed. On the other hand, to have it in religious terms mis yeah. misleads you. And, 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 uh, and uh, uh, people do, do step up during this moment. And yeah. uh, there's a, there's a um, Prussian officer who comes. Tell me, I can't, I'm getting old and I can't remember his names as well these days. Okay. But he comes and he helps to train the Continental Army throughout the Valley Forge winter. Right. And that up until now, they had no training together and different units had different uniforms and they didn't, but he learned, he teaches them how to drill together. And you say, well, that's not really that. Yes, it is. For example, in an 18th century battle, okay. you've got to be able to load and reload within a minute. Right. Okay. You got to be practiced at that. You got to be able to do that when the guy next to you is disemboweled. If you're going to retreat, you have to retreat as a unit. You have to have 28 inch steps and 32 inch runs, and you have to be able to reload on the run and turn and fire. He taught them all that over mm. this over the winter. The next battle they go to, um, the British are really surprised at the effect for the first time. The Continental Army is a match for the professional British Army after his instruction, and they this is, is acquired during Valley Forge. Hmm. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and we end up uh, well, the, 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 really the culminating battle, right, is 1781 Yorktown. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yep. And Cornwallis surrenders. At right. The end. He does. Yes. At the end, uh, he doesn't then surrender. He does. He won't appear. He stays in his cave. He has an underling go out and surrender. Yeah, right. Um, and but then there's interesting history here because people often think everything sort of ends in 1783. But a lot of a lot of that's because it took two years basically to negotiate this Treaty of Paris, not the Peace of Paris, right? Uh, which which yeah, is time consuming, yeah. but very important here because let's not. Let's not give short shrift to our French allies who were happy to participate yeah. against the British, who proved pivotal in this war, Absolutely. who then ended up via their participation. I love this history, end up sowing the seeds of kind of their own. You're right. You're discord and revolution about. because of the whole, you know, then they're broke and they got to go to the Estates General, which leads to the French Revolution. It's so fascinating, right? I don't want to go you, too far. You're right. one of the few journalists I've ever known that knows that. It's true. It's absolutely Well, true. I love history. I love history. Yeah, so I try the, to the, be, the French, you know. Yeah. We could not have won the war without the French. Okay. And right. the French basically bankrupt themselves in right. doing it. And um, Lafayette a Frenchman who joins Washington's team early on. He's only 19 years old, for God's right. sake. But when the American Expeditionary Force landed in France in 1917, right. the American commander uh, said, uh, Lafayette, we are here. 
and yeah. we're gonna <laughs> we are we're coming to pay you back uh, in a in a big way. And I always find I go to I go to France. I typically go annually, and whenever I see the statue of Washington in Paris, I'm always moved. And the multiple statues of Liberty, of course, that was later, but I'm always deeply moved because of that. You know that that England is a special relationship, but but Fran, the French, you know. They laid it on the line for us. There's no, there's no overrating Marquis de Lafayette. I mean, no, he, no, he, no. And, uh, and Lafayette tries to, he's the one person who keeps telling Washington that the war ultimately has to be about slavery too. And that, um, that he needs to set the example. And why don't, why doesn't he, and I, Lafayette will help him uh, set up a, a school for, for, for freeze blacks set up a school in what is now West Virginia uh, as a place where they can make the adjustment and he'll pay for it because he's got mm-hmm. infinite amount of money and Washington says hey, that's a great idea he never does it Lafayette does the same thing off the coast of Latin America in an island called Cayenne he sets up his own a place for freed blacks when the revolution happens, the French government takes it away from it and it becomes Devil's Island, hmm. which is really ironic. But that there are, Lafayette's the loudest voice for the notion that this war must be a war, not just for independence, but for the ending of slavery. He is one of the loudest voices on that. Yeah. Uh, and and I want to, so I want to jump forward a little bit. Um we're basically, as you talked about the second founding, 1787, and and then the Northwest Ordinance, because there was, okay, Native Americans really, I mean, who, who, I don't know who's to say who had it worse, but the Native Americans really, with the, with these, with the sort of founding of the new nation, we're going already into the second founding now, you know, got got hosed, of course, the slavery. The the, the bulk of the Native American population, especially the Iroquois Confederation, which is the the biggest and most militarily powerful, side with the Brits during the war. Uh, Right. uh, Some tribes, like um, one tribe, I'm from a dozen, and and they're almost wiped out as a result by the Iroquois. And and, um, uh, Washington does send a 2,000 or 3,000 man force into uh, upstate Hudson and then across New York to put down the Iroquois. Uh, uh, the Iroquois have been massacring civilians up and down the, uh, the river system and um, to put them down. So the Iroquois got the message before all the other Native Americans. Uh oh, if these guys win the war, we're in trouble. We can live with the Brits because they're not going to inhabit here. But if these guys win the war, right, we're facing a huge a population that's going to start sweeping across the continent. And I think that I would like to believe that there was an answer to that problem. Okay. Washington comes up with an answer. This goes beyond the current book uh, to, to what I'm writing about now. Okay, that is in his first term, Washington's really busy. He's got all kinds of things to do. He thinks he's got to visit every state, too. Um, But Benjamin Rush, his former head of artillery, says. Unless we do something. There will not be any Indian east of the Mississippi in 50 years. And that would be a tragedy, but a violation of our oath as officers in the Continental Army. And you need to do something. And he sounds almost like a modern day liberal in this Mm. conversation. And and Washington says, okay, he throws everything else away and they try to create a policy. It's, it's, It's legislated in a treaty called the Treaty of New York in 1790. Here's the idea. We're going to make the Creek Nation our model here. The Creeks are like the Iroquois of the South. They control a lot of other tribes. We're going to sign a a treaty with them. We're going to guarantee them a certain area of land that's theirs. And in the area, it's eastern Georgia, most of it of uh, uh, southern Tennessee and across most of um, Alabama. Big territory. Mm -hmm. 
we will protect you in that territory and provide you with uh, tools and everything and you can make a transition to farming because farming doesn't require as much land as hunting and gathering. We guarantee that. Right. And this is a model treaty. We're going to sign other treaties with other tribes and we're going to create a series of homelands, Indian homelands. And someday, maybe in 50, 100 years, they can be admitted as states. That's what his vision is. Right. He can't enforce it. No. He can't enforce it because you can't stop this, the people coming across the border in pursuit of their own happiness, which is land. Right. right. And that's the reason, in the end, I think that the failure to solve the Native American dilemma or to yeah. problem is probably a Greek tragedy. Yeah. I don't see how it could have happened. Washington did more than anybody could have expected to try to avoid that outcome. And if Washington failed, Washington's not used to failing. And he later in his, just when he's won the retirement of, from the presidency, he says, it's the biggest failure of my presidency. Um, I mean, I always thought the idea of manifest destiny, the notion that there's a providential right to acquire land and expand westward would be incompatible with any kind of democratic idea of living alongside Native Americans because by definition, you have to abrogate every treaty and destroy every tribe. By definition. Manifest I mean, destiny. Comes am I right? I mean, how yeah, else I agree do you do it? That. It's a term that comes into existence in the 17, I mean, 1840s. Right. What I'm saying is that generation has got accustomed to what is essentially massacring the Native American population. Yeah. That wasn't true for the revolutionary generation. No. Okay. No. Um, and they knew that the Iroquois were formidable. And, um, uh, and by the way, the, the Indian, the Native American tribes further west didn't know what was coming. I mean, no. that, and they presumed they were safe. They presumed they controlled their own land. And who would these people over here you know, never walked their land, never hunted on it? How could they possibly do it? You know, that they were, and they had no sense that they were about ready to become victims. They didn't think like victims. Um, but on that side of the tragic leisure, yeah, um, I think it's it's probably a Greek tragedy, and um, yeah, and that's not to excuse anything. No, no, no. Well, I think I think the thing I like to say, and I think you, you know, uh, the cause does this very well, and I think historians who. Are honest about about the history. Look at things uh, in a both things are true manner. You know there were, as you pointed out, whether it be uh, Marquis de Lafayette, although he's French, or whether it was in, these were internal debates that that even Madison and Jefferson didn't really want to countenance about slavery. The ideas of of ending slavery were real. Again, the South wasn't mm -hmm. going to take part of it. They couldn't have formed the Union had they been. But they pushed it, but this was a real debate. And the idea of preserving uh, indigenous populations was also real. That being said, right, real life events had other plans. So, yeah. but, but you, but I think present as historians who just come out and say in a tendentious way, and quite frankly, in historic, in an ahistorical way, that the whole idea of the American experiment was just simply to oppress other people. I think, right. I think that that is, does a great disservice to a group of people, by the way, who left, I still think the greatest blueprint for freedom, the world's I, I Look, I think that's, you and I are on exactly the same page here. Yeah. I mean, when you, the social historians began to say, look, we want to do, and social historians, we want to do Native Americans, African Americans, and women. These have right. been ignored people. I said, great, go ahead. Of course. But they, but what, what I say is do that and then fold them into the larger right. narrative. That's it. They think that is the only narrative. No. Okay. No, and it's no. not. It's That's not. the 1619 projects. There's a right. lot of things in there that are very good. Again, there are things in there that are very good. But I think where, um, and I've interchanged with her on Twitter, where Hannah Nicole Jones gets ahead of her skis, is she acts as if she knows everything there is to know. The, and that I, okay I believe, not. I believe, oh, and then, the, yeah. yeah, the New York Times editorial page is also to blame. Oh, if, oh yeah. If the if the barricades should ever go up in a civil rights war, I'm on their side. Okay. Of but, course. Of course. But the first blacks 
it come to Virginia did not come in 1619. No. They had already been there for 20 years. Yep. yep. The blacks who did arrive were not enslaved. No. Okay. Right. Slavery didn't exist in Virginia until 1662. Right. Okay. They And they intermarried with whites during this time. Yeah. More importantly, 1776 was not a war to protect slavery. I know. Well, that's a huge. That's the biggie. Okay. That is. That's the one that they are. That's the one that, I don't know. Were you one of the signatories with Wilentz and Wood against this, that idea? They asked me, but I didn't do it because I just want to get involved in that stuff at the time. Yeah. But, but the, the, Wilentz can, anyway, that, that the underlying principle of the, of that 161976 is that there is some, Racism beneath the surface of American society has always been there. That right. is true. That is correct. The specific right. way in which they implement it, they think they get handles by 16, 19, and 76. Those are not good handles. They just no. don't work for your for your thing and for your for your argument. But um, uh, and in some sense, it is a perfect example of a kind of presentistic thing. And I believe the New York Times was told by a group of historians maybe the ones you mentioned and some others that they needed to get this right. And yeah. they just ignored them. I know they just completely ignored them. Yeah. I mean, like I said at the beginning, you know, having you on the program, uh, you know, and having a real discussion about ideas is the thing that we don't do. And the whole founding of our country was a dispute, right? A bitter one about the role of government and the role of who we are. And it remains so. That's the tension built into our country, that our is, federalist system. And that's, by the way, not all things have to be necessarily resolved, but also not all actions are forever irredeemable either. You know, I mean, in other words, th th we, we took the basis in two and a half centuries almost now to try to do better than we we might have hoped on a lot of groups that have been left out of the story. It's not like, you know, this we, we have to live in the world we're living in. You know, this idea that we're not living in, we're not even living, we're certainly not living in 1790. And we're not also not living in 1950. We're living in 2024. And we've got to really think as serious people, of citizens of a country that we are imperfect and we are flawed, but we've made a lot of progress. And when people yeah. say that we haven't, I think they're in cloud cuckoo land or yeah, they're is, such ideologues. That it's, the, it's, I, the greatest yeah. generation in American political history, That's they, they are. They are. They are all imperfect to think they were gods. In some and who way. isn't? And who isn't? Yeah, well, like, you know, like if we really think they're gods, what in heaven's name do we have to learn from? And um, right. I think that this is the nation that... Um, that defined the liberal tradition in American history. Yes. That defeated the tyrannies of Germany and Japan and Russia yep. in the Cold War. Yeah. Um, they made a promise in the beginning. And it's a promise that's still not completely fulfilled by any stretch. Right. In my own judgment, it is the fact that we are succeeding in right. moving along the, that track right women's rights yep. gay rights yep. certainly black rights and the end of slavery the irony is the re, the backlash comes whenever you're winning right okay that what we're witnessing in america now and i think this is one of the meetings that make america great again before Martin Luther King had, before a black man occupied the White House, before Martin Luther King had his dream, yeah, okay? sure. before all these women were appearing before us on news programs, before we watched gays kissing in ads, okay? Um, this this is what it means that, that the very progress, you know, like, remember when, uh, what's the guy, uh, Paul Bryan, the coach of Alabama, uh, back in the, the late 50s, great coach. And he got beat in the Rose Bowl by USC badly because Sam the Bam Cunningham scored four touchdowns. He went back to Alabama and said, I've got to get me some of them there, boys. And Sam the Bam, of course, was a black guy. And that's how the right. SEC gets integrated. Um, but is anybody going to claim that, um, you know, that anyway, that, that we're moving ahead in a direction of becoming a, a multiracial society. Yeah. 
that's in keeping with the values of the revolution. Yeah. All men and women are created equal. By the way, Jefferson doesn't really believe in the own words he writes. Okay? I know. I know. He doesn't. He's going to not pass the test. Right. Um, but uh, Lincoln did. Sure did. Um, and Martin Luther King certainly did. Yeah. And both of them paid with their lives for believing that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know who else did and who believed in the words of the of, of our founders? Frederick Douglass. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, he 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 yeah. he literally. I mean, if anyone's ever read any Douglas, I mean, he's as much an American exceptionalist as anybody. Right, and you know, he defended Lincoln too when when some people were trying to attack him. It was crazy, but uh, I think that what we're seeing, it seems to me, is at the founding, we create, we win our independence, we create the first nation-sized republic since Rome. Okay, that's a big yeah. deal too. Yeah. It is, and yeah. we declare these principles at the base. Now, I think it's fair to say that if you had tried to implement them during the war or during the time of the Constitution's being shaped, you would have never won the war and you would have never got the Constitution ratified. Mm -hmm. Okay, the southern states would not have gone along, but that and so that the sectional conflict, which will is it is almost inevitable that they were going to see a civil war. You can see that coming. It's like Niagara Falls. You can hear it coming in the in the early 19th centuries, you know, just after what Washington and one of his last statements made to some members of his former cabinet said, if the current sectional crisis becomes a war, I want it known that my spirit goes with the North. Okay. You tell people in the South that and they go nuts. But um, uh, and by the way, I'm a Southerner. Uh, but uh, that the biggest lie in American history hmm. by far is that the Civil War was not about slavery. Oh, and, uh, yeah. and that, 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 that that's the legend of, you know, that the, the South lost one lost the war, but won the peace. And that they could, anyway, we're to other sections of American history now, but they, they all no, but, but I, but I think, yeah, but it I think per your moment in 76, yeah. when we, yeah. and it is Jefferson's words are the man, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, that is the first nation in the world to declare that. Slavery is wrong and all equality among all people is, is their direct answer, but it's going to take a long time for that to be implemented. Yep. And I think the underlying crisis in America now is still an argument about yeah. whether or not those can be implemented in a society yeah. this big and diverse. I, I, I agree. I, 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 before we close, uh, Joe, what do you think about um, – Let's just go to contemporary America for a second. Okay. So we at this podcast uh, are uh, independent. I am not a member of either political party. I, I subscribe partially to Groucho Marxist theory. I wouldn't want to be a member of a party right. that had me as a member. But no, but in all seriousness, I have so many. I'm just an ideological hybrid, you know, and obviously the, the you know, the calcification of the party's own ideas are going that way. I think the extremes are poisonous. I think there's twin th threats of illiberalism, though I do think there's an asymmetry because I think what the right is up to is far more menacing. What is your take about this year's election? And what do you think it would be long term implications would be for democracy if Trump got back into power? I think this is the most important presidential election in my lifetime. Yeah. And that. Uh, we're an inflection point, as you said, and we're yeah. going to go one way or the other way. Um, and there's a substantial portion of the electorate. And I think that's the core of the Trump constituency. And you can't argue with them. They're pretty, conf you know, they're in a cult. Oh, yeah. They, and that um, the dangerous part about it is that what we call democracies like virginity. Once you lose it, you can't get it back. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm an independent too. I've, I'm a registered independent. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Southern uh, yeah. from Virginia. Went to college at William Mary. 
Um, yeah. But that if we cross that line, uh, it means that we have decided we are no longer a republic. The right word isn't democracy. Right. The right word is republic, respublica. And what that means is a government in, that is defined by the rule of law. And what concerns me is we historians have failed. I think the justice system is currently failing us, but the historians have failed in producing a generation of youngsters that are grounded in American history. But when and that the population is vulnerable to lies and misinformation and its conspiracy theories because it's got no foundation hmm. to to, uh, to disagree to give them information about about truths and i think in that sense we're highly vulnerable yeah uh, um, and um i uh, i've given some thought to it i was asked to do an op-ed on this and i didn't do it if Donald Trump is elected, first of all, if he's elected, I think he will win in the Electoral College, but lose by four to six million votes in the popular vote. I agree. Yeah. Um, the way he's liable to lose the win is because of third party candidates. Yep. Um, all right. Suppose he wins. Here's a question. Can Donald Trump take the oath of office? Because the oath, I happen to have it right here. Mm -hmm. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Um, he really can't take that now. Mm -mm. now well, he course, sullied it so long ago, you know. Yeah, but he's he's yeah, but I mean, I guess the answer is he can certainly take it. You know, you know, I can get overly clever and he can say, well, I never read the Constitution, so I don't know what's in it anyway. And he can't read the Constitution. And um, but um, in some ways, the chief justice who we, uh, administers this should yeah. say, well, wait a minute. For you, Trump, in order to take the oath, you've got to. Un, you've got to deny certain things that you've already said. Like I'm going right. to be a dictator the first day of my presidency. Right. Uh, and and, um, and I believe I'm above the law and I can kill anybody I want to. That's what he said. And um, so, but Trump's not going to say that. I guess what I'm saying, we're at an inflection point. We're going to go one way or the other. I'm concerned that as a historian at my generation hasn't done as well as we should have in preparing the rising generation in having a good grasp of what's at stake. And, um, yeah. and um, that I have no, you know, Chris, I mean, historians are really good at predicting the past. Yeah. We can tell you omnisciently who's going to win the civil war and who won the election in 1960. We're no better than anybody else at predicting the future. And uh, I am, however, in agreement with you. We're at a crucial moment in American history. And my major message, it, it shows, go out and vote. But a high turnout in a presidential election in the United States is 62%. I know. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. It's, it's, like 80 to 100 million people not voting or something. Yeah. Right. Vote. Vote, yeah. vote, without telling you how to vote, vote. Right. And um, uh, the Electoral College is partly to blame because if you're living in certain states, it's like, what difference does it make? You know, California is going to go this way and yeah. Alabama is going to go that way and that kind of thing. But um, uh, I make a plea on your program to anyone who's listening, please make a decision to vote and, um, and investigate the issues at stake and then cast your ballot. Thank you. And fo and folks, for, for listeners uh, listening to the great Joseph J. Ellis, um, and who is a national treasure, and I mean that, but he's imploring you to vote. And I, as I always do implore you to vote, but I also implore you to do something that even the best historians can't make you do, and that's read. 
Read Joseph uh, Ellis's books. Read <laughs> the founding. Listen to the music of the revolution. Read the words. Understand why we're here. Understand what we shouldn't be taking, what we shouldn't take for granted, what was formed, what was fought for, because it all matters. It's these are debates that still royal us today. Far too many people are not even engaged. And if they are engaged, they just want to believe what they want to believe. Um and uh, that is to this republic's detriment, and that is the place we are at. That is at we are at that is so concerning, um, but yet so imperative that um, we all listen, learn, evolve, and take our responsibilities as American citizens. Not like it's not medicine, folks. It's serious. It's real. Um, I mean, the founders. Yeah. If you gathered them, you know, I periodically talk to the founders. Of course, they talk with me every day. But that's, I mean, I'm just reading their papers. That's what yes. I'm doing. Yeah. But um, if the founders saw this moment, most of them would say, we told you so. Yeah. We're, you're vulnerable to demagogues. It's actually a miracle that it's taken this long for a demagogue to make it to the White House. And they've been governors and yeah. other Coughlin and that kind of thing. Yeah. That, that the Republic is always based on a democratic foundation and democracies yep. are inherently vulnerable yep. to this kind of uh, demagogue. And that it's actually a surprise. Yeah. That it's taken this long. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, on that note, despondent though it may be, it's truthful. And we I think we got to say something better, but uh, no, no, I, 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 I'm, you know, like I want, I don't want to end up in a, in a, in a graveyard here, but I think, that, <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're, we're currently whistling past it unless we do something. You know? Okay. Like they warned us it was coming now that they warned us, let's make sure it doesn't happen. Absolutely. Heed the warning. Joseph J. Ellis, uh, whose recent book, The Cause, The American Revolution and its, and its Discontents, is available everywhere. But there are another 11 books, Pulitzer Prize winning books, books on Jefferson, Washington, Adams, and the founding. Um, again, uh, I so greatly appreciate you joining us. Um, you are invaluable, really are uh, an American treasure. And I thank you. So uh, dirty moderates, stay dirty, stay moderate, and stay safe.